coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Cooler temperatures overnight as Nintendo purchases Shiver Entertainment. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined, as I am always joined, by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. We've got a good show for you today. We're going to be talking about the news from the week, including Nintendo acquiring Shiver Entertainment. Uh, And then on Thursday, we are talking about the legacy of the Nintendo GameCube library. But Mark, in the meantime, how's it going? It's going great. How's it going for you, Patrick? I always get nervous when I'm doing like a character voice within the opening of Uh the show, because I got to do like... Because I'm already doing a character voice. The layers voice. go deep. <laughs> the layers go deep, and I've got to be like, is this uh, me doing the voice, or is it the <laughs> announcer me doing the voice? Are you ever worried when you're two layers in that you're not going to be able to dig yourself out and find your actual voice again? As long as I don't have another layer in there, then i got to bring the little top with me and spin it, uh-huh. make sure that I can get out. Is that the third layer that they, or is the, is the fourth layer the, like, I have, I've apart? only seen that movie whose name I'm blanking on. Like, I love there's this. There's panic in I'm my not, eyes. I'm not going to tell no, you I'm what gonna, it is. I'm going to get there. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get there. Yeah, you it's, should. It's uh, Christopher Null Inception. There we go. I, uh, I've only <laughs> seen Inception once, and it was in theaters. Yeah, same. And I remember really enjoying it, and that's part of the reason why I've chosen to never watch it again. Right, because what if you don't enjoy it now? Yeah, I mean, I guess the stakes aren't that high. Right. I just be like, oh, that movie that I liked 15 years ago or whatever, I don't like as much anymore. Yeah, I mean, you're a different person. The media landscape has changed in that time. Like, But I've only seen it that once. So right. I don't remember if it was three layers or if that's just the appropriate layers of a really good dip. Uh, well, I mean, the appropriate layers of a really good dip are seven. Seven? Yeah, seven layer dip. It's like we're in the White House all of a sudden. (laughs) The White House famous for its dips, of course. Um, no, back to, to, I was going to say Tenant, uh, but Inception, uh, I have not seen. Batman Begins. uh, Ten? What? (laughs) Mark, we got to get on the same page here. Uh, I I have also only seen Inception the one time in the theater, and I didn't like it. Oh, you did not like I it? I did not like mm, it, no. Mm-hmm. I, I uh, And then afterwards, people were like, it was so confusing. And I was like, the, they never stop explaining to you how the movie works. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're not here to uh, judge whether or not um, Inception is a good movie. Uh, we are here to... Interstellar. What about it? Oh, I I thought we were just naming... Oh, sure. The Prestige. The Christopher Nolan movies. Um, uh, Dunkirk. My favorite Christopher Nolan movie. Oh, interesting. Sarah had a panic attack during uh, Dunkirk. I totally, be- I totally believe that. I'd like, not, not, not uh, specifically Sarah. I just Sounds mean- like it was a specific <laughs> dig at Sarah. No, just because that movie is anxiety inducing. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it it's like, really is. It's a ticking clock, literally, that entire movie. The, reason the following. I'm- oh, yeah. Um, Memento. <laughs> is this good? I don't know if it's good. It's happening. Sorry, you were saying? It's not worth it. Okay, all right. Um, well, if you want to hear us name Christopher Nolan movies, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Nintendo Cartridge Society, where if you are supporting us at the 8-bit or 16-bit levels, you can get access to our once-a-month episodes of miniseries that we are working on our way through. Mark, we are doing NCS Arcade right now. That's right. Uh, that is a series where Patrick and I play... Games available on Nintendo Switch Online and Nintendo Switch Online Plus Expansion Pack that we've never beaten before. We just released an episode on Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and a uh, addendum episode where we talked about listener emails about Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Mm-hmm. And it, for the month of May, we are going to be talking about the original NES Metroid. Yes. So if you have comments, questions, memories, whatever about the original NES Metroid, or if you're playing along with us and you want to make sure that we read some of your emails, uh, you should email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at gmail.com uh, and let us know that you want to talk about Metroid because uh, then we will use that and have a conversation um, using those emails. Why can't Metroid crawl? Why, why can't Metroid crawl? It's got no knees. That's why. <laughs> Metroid caught no knees. <laughs> No game, no knees. <laughs> That's right. Uh, no knees can't crawl, right? 
It's a Metroid. Um, <laughs> that's a Metroid. <laughs> Uh, so any check that out if you are interested. Also, you should be in our Discord where you can also talk about Metroid, but we probably won't be able to collate that for use on uh, an episode talking about it. Um, but email us, Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com, gmail and we will let you in there. Mark, we've got some kind of Nintendo Direct coming up in June. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and if you're not in the, in the Discord uh, to chat about that as it's happening, uh, what are you doing? It's one of those great questions of philosophy. It's like a riddle, yeah. Um, uh, I just want a quick shout out. I was on, uh, this week's episode of video games, a comedy show, uh, hosted by Jeremy Schmidt featuring me, Connor McCabe and July Diaz killer lineup. It's a killer lineup. We are talking about our favorite video game quotes. That's good. Yeah. That's a, that's a great uh, episode idea. Yeah. So, uh, check that out. It is in wherever you find a podcast and then also just want to plug. Uh, my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle source book that I wrote. Uh, issues one and two are in comic stores now. Issue three comes out in June. So uh, pre-order, it may be too late to pre-order uh, issue number three at this point, but you can still order issue number four. I'm positive of that. Check it out in comic book stores if you're interested in the Ninja Turtles or what I have to say about them. Um, Mark, let's get into what we've been playing this week. <laughs> Obviously, we've both been playing Metroid. It's all about Metroid for me. It's all about Metroid for yeah, you. Yeah, that, that's basically what I played okay. this past week. Yeah, um, that's a lot of what I played as well, but uh, we will save our commentary for that for the uh, the, the Patreon episode. Um, Mark, a couple of Game Boy games showed up on Nintendo Switch Online uh, last week. Basically, uh, the second our episode posted, they were like, oh, by the way, you get uh, three Game Boy games. Mark and Patrick, you don't get to talk about it until a week later. Um, but so those games are Baseball, Alleyway, and Super Mario Land. Nice to see Super Mario Land on there. Nice to see Alleyway on there. I could take or leave Alleyway, but you're right. It's, I can't believe you do this to Alleyway every time. <laughs> nice, nice to have, nice to, uh, just from like a completionist yes. perspective, yes. nice to have that on there. Nice to have baseball on there for the same reason. Right. It's now just missing um, tennis from the launch lineup. And I wonder if they'll do it. Um, because, like, there already is a Mario Tennis on the Game Boy Color. So, like, it truly would just be, like, a completionist thing to have the entire U.S. launch lineup um, available on NSO. Yeah. And so, th for that part of it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm sure Tennis will show up there eventually. But never discount Nintendo's ability to just make super weird choices. make no sense. Yes. When it comes to these Nintendo Switch Online releases. Uh, but so I play. I spent some time playing Alleyway, um, which uh, Sarah was watching me play. And she said, I know you're having fun, but this is the most boring thing to watch. And I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alleyway is just like a normal uh, brick breaker um, uh, and is like kind of the perfect... Uh, sitting in the back of your mom's station wagon, you know, on a trip up north, a uh, game that you can kind of play forever, uh, die and start over, and it's like nothing happened. You know what I mean? Like, it's just uh, uh, it, like playing Snake on your phone, right? Maybe Nintendo purposefully held Super Mario Land from launch because they're like, we're already going to get press discussion about having Game Boy games sure. on Switch. So let's just hold Super Mario Land for when we want another pop, you know, because because yeah. I feel like, you know, they've released other Game Boy games and uh, I feel like Super Mario Land had, was a, another level of discussion. You know, when that true. finally yeah. showed up, yeah. it uh, filtered above the typical Nintendo fan sites that are keeping track of these and hit like the mainstream press, right? Like, oh... On the verge, you can finally play Super Mario Land on Nintendo Switch Online. Right. Like, the weirdest Mario game is now available for you to play. Yeah. Um, I, I went through and I played the whole game, um, which took me all of 22 minutes. Like, I think you can beat this game faster than you can watch an episode of The Simpsons. Um, uh, it is so short. It is four worlds of three levels each. Um, and uh, two of those worlds, or two of those levels are, like, vehicle levels. Um, this is none of this is new to me. I had a, a copy of this game growing up. I just kind of want to like recap it um, here. Uh, but yeah, the end of World Two, you're in like a submarine uh, and you're like shooting little torpedoes. And at the end of uh, World Four, you're in a plane, uh, so you can fight 
um, Tatanga, the the alien who has captured Daisy. A couple uh, like strange, funny things about this game. Um, it has the same setup as uh, Super Mario Brothers in that like when you get to the end of a world, um, there's what appears to be a princess, and they uh, or it, not even that, but like you know that like thank you Mario, but our princess is in another castle. So there appears to be a princess, but she turns into a bug or some kind of enemy and then like jumps away right and the the text on screen says thank you mario and then oh daisy <laughs> exclamation point i like that as an exclamation yeah for when like something goes wrong i just gotta know who's saying that yeah well i guess who's saying am i saying am i saying oh daisy in the original super mario brothers who is saying Thank you, Thank Mario. You, Mario but our prince, is it the Toads? I the, think it's the, the Toad like, Retainer. Yes. The Retainer. Yes. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. Huh. Maybe the bug is saying it. But, okay. He's saying, oh, Daisy. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it doesn't know how to. It, it's it yeah, worked like men up in qu- black. Quite an effort. Yes, that's uh-huh. right. It is, uh, is a bug wearing a Daisy suit. And all it knows about Daisy is her name. And so uh-huh. it just tries to say that and then turns into a bug and hops away. Yeah, maybe. Demands a glass of sugar water. <laughs> Is it, uh, I think it's interesting that we have a special place in our heart for Wart, the kind of forgotten boss of yes. Super Mario Brothers 2 or Super Mario Brothers USA, but I can't really get that worked up about Tatanga, about people not caring about Tatanga. Yeah. Like, um, I've never, like, Tatanga should be in Smash Brothers. Well, so this is interesting. I've been saying Tatanga, and I don't know uh, which one of us is right. <laughs> Is it T A T A N G A or is it T A N T O N G A? I I honestly think we should continue to say it differently, so that way, whichever one is right, we have our bases covered. Okay, and but, we never have to find out. Okay, great. So, but do you keep saying Tatanga and I keep saying Tatanga? I think so. Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, maybe we'll uh, look. Uh, halfway we might th- accidentally switch halfway through the episode. Let's switch. <laughs> uh okay so uh uh metroid yes uh alleyway yes super mario land yes um i'm you know i'm also uh still working on final fantasy 7 rebirth and i'm starting to panic a little bit because we are well should we just get into the new releases yeah let's do it and what we might be playing next week uh mark this is the new releases and what we might be playing next week All right, uh, Patrick, you put together the show notes this week, and when I was looking at the new releases, yes, I was like, "Aha! I think I found an error here." Right, because you, you said, have you idiot, <laughs> you have Paper Mario: The Thousand Year Door as yes. releasing Thursday, May twenty third, which is not a Nintendo day to release things. No. They're they're a they're a Friday company. They. Do you remember when it, they used to be a Sunday company? I do remember. What, like yes. in the Wii era. When they I were remember, like groundlings. <laughs> I remember going to Best Buy uh-huh. when Mario Kart Wii was released. <laughs> this and is it was, exactly the game I was going and to use it was for a Sunday. Anecdote. Yes. But then... Uh, some, also Smash. I remember going to, yeah. to Best Buy on a, uh, and, a Sunday for that. And then, you know, probably 10, probably more than that, probably like 15 years ago, they switched to being a, uh, to doing their new releases on Friday. Except when you get a thousand year door on uh, Thursday. Uh, so, uh, Endless Ocean Luminous was also a Thursday release. What is happening? Uh, but that's something where I'm like, that's mo- that feels like as third party as a first, as a published by Nintendo game could possibly be. Um, so, I was like, and that, that's fine, right? A uh, retail price of 50 bucks. I feel like the rules are just a little like wishier, washier. Um, but here we are, yeah, th- uh, Thursday release for Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door. I'm going to look up Luigi's, Luigi's Mansion 2 HD. Oh, yeah. Because I, okay, so that releases on June 27th. Okay, and is that a Thursday or a Friday? June 27th is a Thursday. So did... What? Wait, what's happening? D- did Nintendo just stealthily... Become a Thursday company? Become Yeah, like a Thursday company and nobody... I just feel like this should have been flagged for me by somebody. Right. I mean, maybe that's us. Do we have... Okay. Uh, what other new release from Nintendo has a release date? Do we have... No, that's it. Oh, interesting. I mean... Uh, There's like third-party stuff for October that we know of, right? But y- Yeah. Well, and like we know that uh, Pokemon comes out next year. Right. But nothing Legends, with like but a nothing hard with a date. Yeah. date. Huh. All right. I guess like watch this 
space. Baby <laughs> Nintendo <laughs> is just releasing on Thursdays now. I think we've oh, shifted. No, no, we do. Like a... What what is the date of the um uh uh Oh, Nintendo yes. World Championships. Nintendo World Championships, I believe, is the 12th, uh, which is a Wednesday, so that may not even be right. But Okay, Nintendo World Championships. Or it's, it's July. Releases on the 18th. July 18th? Yeah. A Thursday. Okay. I think we just made like a bombshell discovery here. Nintendo is a Thursday company. Yeah, this is, this is wild. Do you think they're just slowly working, like, in 20 years from now, they'll be, like, Tuesday? They'll be a Monday company. <laughs> they'll be a Monday company. And then they'll be a Sunday company again. Right. They will have gone full circle. Pe- yeah. I mean, remember when, like, uh, new thing, new things, like, media in general used to come out on Tuesday? That that was, like, yes, new yeah. uh, home video releases and new, like, CDs? When, were... I, when I worked at uh, a bookstore, it yeah. was, like, Tuesdays were the big release date for that kind of stuff. Uh, well, so very interesting. Uh, I can't believe we just discovered that in real time, uh, that, uh, I I feel like we've crossed into an alternate plane of reality. Um, it feels, I, I, there's a glitch in the matrix or something. I honestly feel like because is my, uh, uh, top falling over or isn't it? (laughs) I'm sorry. Go ahead. (laughs) Uh, I know I was, I was struggling to think of another Christopher Nolan movie title. But I'm going to get there. Oppenheimer. It's the one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The one with Hilary Swank and Robin Williams. Insomnia. Yes. Pacino is in that, too. Right? Yeah. Is Hilary Swank in that movie? Yes, because I I think Hilary Swank is Al Pacino's, like, partner. And then Robin Williams is the... He's the killer, killer, right? The bad guy. He went through like a phase of being like one hour photo. One hour photo of yes, of course. Now we're just naming movies. We've got to, <laughs> we should just move on. <laughs> here's, here's something I wanted to point out. Also coming out this week uh, on Tuesday is a game called Paper Trail. And also on Thursday, along with Paper Mario, a game called uh, Paper Dash Invasion of Greed. And I just want to know, do you think this is a coincidence that two other games that start with the word paper are coming out the week that Paper Mario Thousand Year Door releases? Oh, yeah. It's just a, it's like a paper trilogy. It is a paper trilogy. I think that people are just like hoping to ride that SEO train and are like, look, people are going to be looking for Paper Mario. Let's just put out our paper game right and now. And maybe somebody will be confused. Yeah. And they'll accidentally buy Paper Trail instead. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, the Papers Please could go for like a new like re-release this week. Uh, just position, set, set yourself up for success, I guess is what I'm saying. Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door. A game that you and I are both uh, interested in and excited for. Yep. Uh, but another, like, you know, dozens of hours long RPG yes. uh, that I feel like is going to come crashing into my Final Fantasy VII Rebirth playthrough, and I don't know what to do. Mark, what do you... I mean, you are you don't have the same conundrum, but are you, are you like, decks cleared, ready for Paper I think, Mario? I think I am. Okay. Um, uh, we have a game in mind for our June Nintendo Switch or N- June NCS Arcade episode. Yes, that is going to take uh, a, a time commitment. Yes. Um, but I think I can balance the two. I, uh, I think one thing that's nice for you, although I guess it's true for uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth as well, that like, I don't really feel like you have to rush through Paper Mario Thousand Year Door. That's a great point. Um. It's not like, you know, Tears of the Kingdom or something like that, where... Which we also didn't really rush through, that's right? Right, but yeah. where it's like, oh, like, everybody's playing it right now, everybody's talking about it right now. Right. Like, Thousand Year Door came out during the GameCube. It's a known quantity. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I just, I, I feel like you have the luxury of time with that one. Um, I, <laughs> a friend of mine, uh, what up, Delaney, if you're listening? Um, was complaining about the trailer for the new Wicked movie, right? Uh, giving away the whole story of uh, the uh, of the movie, um, but like, it's been a Broadway show for decades. Like, it's already right. Like, is is there any danger of the uh, the trailer giving too much away at that point? I also think that a guiding principle of movie trailers is. Audiences, generally speaking, do not want to be surprised. They want to know yes. what they're buying. Right. And so I think it's like, it's why, like, 
in the in trailers for comedies, they often put like the, the best, best jokes. jokes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, also that's like, it's like the way to sell what you're gonna get, right? Is like, here, look, you see how funny this is? Why would you show the bad jokes? <laughs> You know, if I were writing a comedy, I just wouldn't write any bad jokes in it. Oh, but that's just me. What a, what a great point. Your comedy would have no jokes in it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're excited about Paper Mario. Um, I don't know any, anything else to say uh, on 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 that game, or are we just like we're going headlong into it and we'll play it and be happy about it. Yeah, I I am excited that this is being released on Switch. It'll be interesting to see what like the full breadth of the quality of life yes. improvements mm-hmm. they've made to it. Because uh, I really like Thousand Year Door. It did have a lot of backtracking. It wasn't a perfect game. So, um, yeah, just interested to see what that all is. Um, all right. Well, those are the new releases. Let's close this segment out. Which brings us to a regular segment on our show. It is time for 433. In 1952, American composer John Cage wrote a piece called 433, where a performer or group of performers didn't play their instruments for four minutes and 33 seconds. For the purposes of this show, our instruments are talking about Nintendo. So for the duration of one performance, 433, Mark and I will talk about something not at all all Nintendo-related, thus fulfilling the contract of the piece. Uh, Mark and I went to the movies last weekend. A lot of movie talk this episode. There is a lot of movie. Is it because we went to the movies? The Dark Knight. Yeah, we were holding off on the Batman ones, right? (laughs) <laughs> and, and now we've like broken the seal there. I think I said Batman Begins at the beginning of the Did episode. Did you really? Yeah. Okay, well then I'll say I Dark slipped Knight it in there. Rises. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, We're gonna run out of Nolan movies by the end of this episode, though. Well, then we'll just have to pick a new director. Um, <laughs> but so we, <laughs> we we saw um, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Uh, that you and I are both fans. Oh, and so this is what we're talking about. Is we're talking about King, uh, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. We'll try not to be very spoilery here. Yeah. Um. Uh, but just to, and we cannot talk about how it's directed by uh, the uh, gentleman who's going to be directing the new Zelda movie because that's talking about Nintendo, right? So, what do you think of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes? Mark? I I really liked it. I've liked all of the Planet of, the newer Planet of the Apes movies. Yeah. Why is Planet of the Apes a series that I care anything about? This is a great question because as a kid. As a kid, they were dusty old movies. They they were dusty old movies, but like, I was like when they were on AMC or something. Yeah, I was. I like I've I had, I've seen all the every Planet of the Apes movie that's right. ever been made. All I have seen ten of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I but I so I have an affinity for uh-huh. the series. I liked the the like previous three, mm-hmm. and then this one like it takes is connected to the previous three, but just like loosely. And is can be its own thing. Yeah, it can definitely be its own thing. I do like that it it takes the so like Caesar is the like main character of the previous trilogy, right? Um, that the Andy Circus uh, ape that um, gets smart and then like leads the rest of the uh, the, the apes to like revolution uh, over the humans, um, and like that's our perspective character kind of throughout that that whole series, right? Which is not like really part of the um like original movies like the original movies would kind of like shift protagonists uh between entries. everybody was dying all the time everyone was and like everyone was dying the end of the second movie is the earth explodes <laughs> um and like the main characters uh in the third one die at the end of that uh-huh um so yeah it's it's all like yes uh the characters be dying um but so uh, Caesar dies at the end of the third of uh, the third like new plan of the Apes movies, and this movie starts off with him like being uh, like burned uh, like a funereal pyre, right? But then it jumps forward like many generations. Yes, many generations is the the language that it says on screen, and then it uses him as like a prophetic figure or like a uh, some uh, a figure to be worshipped, whose whose words get like twisted by different like groups of apes, um, and so like. Just like in how uh, beneath the planet of the apes that they're like the mutants living underground are worshiping an atomic bomb. Um, there's like a question of faith and like what is the intent of Caesar? What is the intent of like the bomb? It's all very. I like the thematic material that the series plays with, and it's cool that the new ones are playing with similar stuff. Yeah, that is one thing that's kind. Of, that's I, I would say this one had less less like 
uh, commentary, like social commentary, than some of the others in the mm-hmm. series do. But I still think it had ideas that it was, yeah. um, you know, like working with. These movies just look so good. This movie looked so good. Kind of, like, kind of staggering, right? To the point where you're like, how are they putting like, and I guess like they've made Avatar movies, so like this is just what that is. But like, how are you putting fully CG, photorealistic characters in? every scene of this movie and it looks and like they look realistic Mm -hmm. like you care about these apes yeah uh it's you laugh at their facial expressions Uh like or at least mark and i did (laughs) (laughs) yeah i i really liked this movie i am uh uh i also just like the look we were talking a little bit about this after the movie like i just like the look of planet of the apes yeah like the the uh like ape scarecrows that harken back all the way to that first movie mm-hmm. the 68 know, just, uh-huh. Apes, yeah this has really striking design yes very striking design and uh i, I actually I, I was like turning over in my head you saying that this uh movie maybe doesn't have as many like philosophical ideas that it's like tackling as um like the the previous ones i think like the original series uh is definitely more leaning on that those kinds of ideas uh, like in a because the first one's co-written by uh, Rod Serling, right? Like it's it's basically uh, a Twilight Zone episode, uh, but a movie. Um, and then like the rest of the movies kind of follow suit. I think the first three in this series don't really play that much with like abstract. Ideas. Rise definitely doesn't. The the very right. first one, the James Franco one. Um, all right. Well, that's <laughs> uh, Mark. I'm glad we had this conversation about uh, the Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. We were accompanied today by an ensemble at the Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix. Mark, let's get into. Hold on, I'm setting up the the music cues here. <laughs> let's get into the news. Nope, nope. I even took extra time to set it up, and it just made applause happen. Let's get into the news. Nintendo has acquired Shiver Entertainment, the studio responsible for ports of recent high-budget multi-platform games on Switch like Mortal Kombat 11 and Hogwarts Legacy. I apologize. That should be Mortal Kombat 1. Oh, Mortal Kombat 1. Yes. Uh, Established in 2012, Shiver Entertainment was purchased by the Embracer Group at the end of 2021. And now, you know, just two and a half years later, Nintendo is buying it. Yes. So this is interesting for a number of reasons, but I think sort of... uh... Uh, maybe not principally among them, but you know, like we we talk a lot about uh uh like mergers and uh, companies being acquired on the show because that's what's happening in the video game industry right now, and it's almost always bad news, right? Um, but in this case, it almost feels like Nintendo is rescuing them from em- from the Embracer Group, right? Yeah, and if if you, it seems like like when's the last time Nintendo shut down a studio? Like right, like it, it feels like if. I mean, were, they if, they let Alpha Dream uh, go under, but like, but that's that was not a them. third party, that's right? A third that party, was like, yeah. Uh, yeah, like, if it kind of feels like being acquired by Nintendo would be the dream for a development studio. Yeah. Well, and okay, so uh, uh, the Switch ports for Mortal Kombat One and Hogwarts Legacy, worth pointing out here that those were hugely successful games on Switch. Um, the so Mortal Kombat One is like a moderately successful game, sold about three million copies. But like that's as much as you know, like that's a that's a successful game, right? Um, but Hogwarts Legacy on Switch sold over twenty four million copies. Is that real? Yes. Wow. So it's a studio that has a track record, right? Well, and so part of the question when I read this was, what are they going to be doing mm-hmm. for Nintendo? And so this is. Part of the notice from Nintendo about the acquisition, quote, Nintendo will acquire 100% of the outstanding shares of Shiver and make it a wholly owned subsidiary. By welcoming Shiver's experienced and accomplished development team, Nintendo aims to secure high-level resources for porting and developing software titles. Going forward, even after it becomes a part of the Nintendo group, Shiver's focus will remain the same, continuing commissions that port and develop software for multiple platforms, including Nintendo Switch. Right. So, but not just Nintendo Switch. Although, the, could that just be leaving the door open for Nintendo Switch and the successor to the Nintendo Switch? Yeah, it's possible. Um, it seems. I don't. Uh, 
I don't know how much work Shiver has done on porting games to other systems. Right. Or like developing on their own. But what I find so interesting about this is um is Nintendo is acquiring Shiver seemingly to continue doing the work that they're doing now, which is yes. port games from other developers to Nintendo platforms. So does this become part of like Nintendo's sales pitch to third parties? Like, hey, you Right. We have the resources to do a good port of this game. Right. And so would not only do we have these resources in the form of uh, the studio that has done a good job of it before, but they are now also backed by us because we own them and we understand it's always true, right? That um Nintendo no one knows Nintendo hardware like Nintendo. So like they're going to be able to basically port anything yeah within reason i suppose uh to the nintendo switch and whatever comes next yeah i i mean it seems like all good news yeah but it's just kind of boggling my mind a little bit that that is i i think it says a lot about where nintendo sees opportunity yeah in getting third parties getting third-party developers to publish their games on Switch, like, or on Nintendo platforms. Like, uh, oh. because I'm wondering, like, is it a scenario where a third-party developer, like, Nintendo goes to a third-party developer and is like, we have the resources to do it, but the third-party developer pays Shiver Entertainment, just like they yeah, would normally, question, you right? know, to, pub to d develop the port. Or is it a scenario where, like, Nintendo goes out, like, shopping to these other third-party games, like, big hits, and they're like, will you let us make a, a, a we'll Switch do, version? Yeah, like, yeah. we will do the work. Yeah, it's a good question. I just had a, a thought that, like, what if this is to um, make uh, games that are being targeted for the Switch 2 playable on the old Switch? Like, what if that's that they are, you know, that they are like leash off for everybody else to, uh, you know, go and like use the new power of the new hardware to make more impressive games. And then it's up to Shiver to figure out how to make those work on the original Switch. Oh, to do like cross generation titles. Yeah. That's interesting. It's a little less exciting, um, but it's, uh, it seems like a, a practical matter just knowing uh, how many Switches are out there in the wild, right? Yeah. That that's a, a, a an audience that you ignore at at your peril. I think the last studio that Nintendo acquired was, and certainly the la last studio outside of Japan that Nintendo acquired was um, Next Level. Next right? Level Games. Yeah. And that was in 2021. Right. Right. So Nintendo's, which was right as Shiver was being acquired by Embracer Group. <laughs> it's just interesting that Nintendo has been on a hiring spree internally like in japan they're trying to grow their um development resources by a lot uh and have they're very picky and choosy about acquisitions yeah but i mean we did also uh hear about them cutting down their qa team uh in the states yes so like it's not all uh growth um but it does seem like it is kind of kind of a lot of growth but not you know not in a like they're not buying Activision Blizzard kind of way, but yeah. 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 It's like they they wait for... It makes sense. Like, Nintendo is such a culture-driven yeah. company that mm -hmm. it makes sense that they would be very choosy about making third-party, like, outside acquisitions right. to grow Nintendo. Right. Well, and, like, you know, it, it's it's less, less true here with Shiver, um, but, like, with something like Next Level, you're like they didn't own next level, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's one of those things where it's like, Oh yeah, they're kind of just like formalizing something that had been uh, going on for a while, a little bit like a uh, PlayStation buying insomniac, you know, for, for example. Um, but uh, yeah, just uh, uh, it, it seems like a, another cool resource that um, Nintendo has going forward here. I also wonder how long it'll take for us to see the fruits of this acquisition. Uh -huh. Cause probably shiver is already working. They were already working on great point. Something for Something. Nintendo, yeah. Yeah, for, or, like, maybe, like, third parties had hired them. Yeah. You know, they're already working on ports for third parties, and then um, now there's this Nintendo acquisition, and how long will it take for it to, like, ramp up and we actually see 
on the implications of Nintendo yeah. owning them. Um, I find the whole like Embracer part of this very interesting, right? That in, the Embracer group is in a uh, position now where they're like, oh yeah, we overspent on studios. Uh, we don't, uh, th- there was some, what was the game that they had like a, a, a bizarre um, like deal with some like local government or something and then that deal fell through? I don't know if it was a specific game. My m- half formed memory, maybe yep. I read a headline somewhere about this, is that the like uh, private equity fund that, that the Saudi that the government of Saudi Arabia yes. uh-huh. owns was like ne- was working with Embracer to make a large investment in Embracer, and then that fell through, and that's kind that of may, started this whole thing. That may be what I'm thinking. Yeah, so that they are in a like a cost cutting mode um, and uh, canceling a bunch of projects. Uh, and like seemingly selling off assets, fire sales seems um, like yeah. So it, that's you know probably where Nintendo was like yeah yeah we can afford to buy you know well you are motivated to sell the we we'll buy yeah um but uh yeah it makes me wonder who else is going to be uh picked up by whom uh from the Embracer Group. Capcom released a new overview trailer for Monster Hunter Stories One, which by the way I just want to like tag in for a second here to be like hey remember Monster Hunter Stories One is coming to Switch. Yeah. Uh, you remember this? <laughs> in June, right? Yes. The remake of the 3DS RPG was announced at the Mini Direct Partner Showcase in February with a release window of this summer. But now we know it is June 14th. Other features touched on in the video Hold include, on, looking it up. Got to know uh, what day uh-huh. of the week it is. June 14th. It's a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. Or I think no, this no, no. one... It's a Friday. My fault. Oh, it's a Friday. But this is a Capcom this game. This is a Capcom game. Right. But Capcom... Nintendo's, not pub- Nintendo's not publishing this I one. I believe they are not. Okay. But I don't know, honestly. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up while you keep reading. Other features that are touched on in the video include refined graphics. So um, this is what it says. Originally released on the Nintendo 3DS, players can now experience riding monsties in <laughs> stunning detail on larger screens, enhanced with improved modeling textures and lighting in high definition. It's now fully voiced. There is additional language support. There's a museum mode where you can delve deeper into the world of Monster Hunter stories, including, like, you can isolate the game's background music and their sketches. Which, of course, is something that we wanted from Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, but we'll never get. Never get. And then you have to, you have to save something for Mario Kart 9, right? <laughs> and then included type here. Sidebar. Yeah. The debate rages online whether the next Mario Kart game will be Mario Kart 10. Because does Tor count as right. Mario Kart 9? Well, here's... Uh, sure. I mean, it, I think it certainly can. Um, if for no other reason than um, the first time we saw a numbered Mario Kart was 7. Right? Like, right. all the rest of them have just had names. And we've been like, but also secretly that one's number 2. <laughs> you know? Um, so, like, 7 and 8 have been the only numbered ones. Uh, and, like, you know, Mario Kart X? Like, yeah, that's... That's a that's a that'd be, yeah that'd be awesome or just give it a name I don't know triple dash yes there <laughs> we go there we go uh, also includes title updates that were previously only available in Japan um, I'm assuming this means that there was like DLC that was available for the I think first you're game right. yes that never was localized outside of Japan but it is included here in this Switch release. Uh, I want, uh, so I confirmed it's being published by Capcom. So that explains why it's not coming out on Thursday. Uh, but I wonder what Capcom's expectations are for this. Um, cause it's not like the Monster Hunter Stories 2, which, you know, launched on, launched on Switch was like a particularly successful or high selling game. Um, yeah, I don't remember hearing anything about, you right. know. Yeah, it sold X number of copies, or even like seeing it in the like bestseller list uh, on on the eShop. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that. This is the first one in the series. They obviously uh, like the premise enough of this one, or like that, like it sales well enough to make a sequel. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It just I'm I'm always curious what, especially as uh you know like developers like Square Enix are like. We got to scale back on this like middle of the road kind of stuff um, that Capcom's like, no, we just keep doing it. We just keep putting stuff out. In a live stream with Hideki Kamiya, Super Smash Brothers director Masahiro Sakurai revealed that he cut Dolby Surround's audio support from the GameCube game Kirby Air Ride 
Mm-hmm. Non-possessive. Non-possessive. This is one of the, to take note. It's not Kirby's air ride. It's just Kirby air ride. Uh, and he did it so they wouldn't have to include the Dolby title card at the beginning of the game, saying that he wanted to keep the time in which people were waiting between turning the game on and being able to start the game to a minimum. Okay, so... And he uh, goes on to say that, like, he wished that that was something that, like, other developers uh, kept in mind. So, gut check. Think about the Masahiro Sakurai games that you've played in the past. Have they been snappy you get to gameplay right away? I can't really remember. I'm thinking Smash Brothers is pretty good at it. Smash Brothers is pretty good at it. Although, Smash on the 3DS, I feel like, takes forever to get into gameplay. But that's just because it's on a 3DS mm-hmm. and it loads slowly. Um, Kirby games, usually pretty fast. Sure. Um, Kid Icarus, I don't remember. Wait, I, I, feel like, I feel like an audit is in order. Yes, yes, exactly. Because there, there are some ways here where this feels, like, self-aggrandizing, right? And, like, do we have any way to verify that, like, he was going to use Dolby Surround and he was like, no, it takes another four seconds to get to gameplay, so we're not doing it? It's just, I just... It's so hard for me to imagine Masahiro Sakurai lying about anything ever. <laughs> no, he's a sweet boy, and I don't mean to, <laughs> I don't mean to put anything he's saying into doubt. Um, but you know, it's just like this feels like s- mythologizing, mm-hmm. right? Um, he wanted to spare everyone four seconds, so uh, he found some other way to make the uh, audio work. I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's it's just a, a funny little detail. Yeah, definitely. I also like the idea of him and uh, Kamiya being friends. I don't know what the context of the video was, but yeah. just like to imagine like Japanese great video game developers hanging out together. Yeah, and especially like uh, in the place that Sakurai is right now, where he's like, I'll say whatever I want, doesn't matter. <laughs> and Kamiya, who's always like that, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, that the two of them together at this point in history is uh, uh, a pretty special thing. Well, speaking of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes and A433, where we didn't talk about the director that much, Mm -hmm. um, Sony Motion Pictures Group Chairman Tom Rothman gave an interview to Deadline last week talking about the Zelda movie, which the director of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, Wes Ball, is Mm -hmm. uh, attached to direct right now, and that they are producing with Nintendo. Understandably, he described the project as massive and huge for us, he also emphasized their close working relationship with Nintendo and Shigeru Miyamoto, saying, quote, because the movie is being developed and made in, in the closest possible collaboration with Nintendo video game designer Shigeru Miyamoto, he's a true genius in that world, and it's really his strong vision that is motivating it. He created it and understands it thoroughly. You only, look, you only have to look at the results of Super Mario Brothers to see. How does that make you feel, Mark? Well, I didn't like the Super Mario Brothers movie. Right, me But neither. there's no denying that it was immensely successful. Right. Massive and huge for us. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think my expectations are low enough yeah. that the Zelda movie would have to be really terrible for me to be disappointed. Sure. Uh, well, but I, I, I do feel like seeing Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes did, like, raise my expectations a little bit i felt raise my hopes for sure yeah i guess that's that that's that that's more accurate. because it was well directed yeah um and like looked great mm-hmm. um so and you know like working in ip that's like a, a little bit tricky to you know whatever um so anyway i i assume that west ball will do a, a a good job directing the movie um and it makes sense to me that like we lean on miyamoto for uh, a Mario movie. Why are we leaning on Miyamoto for a Zelda movie? I know, like, he invents the series uh, and, like, you know, remains, like, interested in it um, and, like, involved in its uh, development, but, like, what about Fujibayashi? What about Aonuma? You know, like, there are these other uh, caretakers of the Zelda brand um, that have been responsible for shaping it over the last you know, at least two decades, probably longer, um, that, like, why are they not the sort of, like, point people for that? And is it just because Miyamoto is, like, Hollywood Miyamoto now? I think that's part of it. I think it's part of his role in Nintendo now. Yeah. Is to 
uh, help them expand into like movies and into theme parks because he was also point person, you know, uh, on, and I'm sure there are other people at Nintendo who are working on these. It was interesting that we learned during the development of Super Mario Brothers Wonder that the team working on Wonder, like they weren't seeing footage of the movie. They were totally separate. Right. Yeah. And I imagine that's the same case here that, um, you know, may- maybe Aonuma is looking at storyboards or whatever, but I'm mm-hmm. guessing that they're, that Nintendo, it seems like Nintendo is pretty purposefully siloing the movie stuff at this point from the video game stuff. Yeah. And the two are not crossing over. And that Miyamoto is like doing a lot of that movie stuff now. Yeah. Yeah. That makes that 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 does make sense to me. There is just something where I'm like, like, where is the juice for for Zelda? Right. Like you could make the argument that like the the special important nugget of uh, Mario that you want to see in a Mario movie is present as far back as the 80s and, and 90s. Right. But like for a Zelda game or for a Zelda movie, rather, like, don't we kind of want to see it looking more like a modern Zelda game. I, I guess I, I I just I'm trying to like pinpoint where like what kind of what manner of Zelda gets adapted. Well, also don't forget that in the lead up to Breath of the Wild, yeah, Miyamoto was front and center for a lot of it. That was not true for Tears of the Kingdom, mm-hmm. but for Breath of the Wild, like there was it the video game awards or some presentation where it was Miyamoto and Aonuma, and they were s- sitting next to a TV. And on, and I think it was Miyamoto who had the Wii U controller and was having Link run through it. Like I would say, it's it's only in the. Uh, and I would also say that, arguably, the Zelda series now is the closest it's been to that first game. That's true. As, as it's ever been in the past, you know, like uh, thirty years between the two of them. So, but I I get what you're saying though. Like as far as what Zelda is today, how much involvement does Miyamoto have? Right. Like none. But as to what the or very little, right. but as to what that the uh, core spark of what Zelda is, I think he can carry that with yeah. him into well, the development of the movie. And obviously now he has this track record of one uh, of like the most successful movie of last year. So what I what are you gonna do? <laughs> what what I, right? Yeah. What what I am interested in seeing is that uh, King, um, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes has been financially successful. Yes. And they, uh, it can clearly, the series can continue after this movie. So I'll be interested to see. The if, world doesn't blow up at the end of it. I'll be interested to see if, a, if an announcement for a sequel is made. Yeah. And if West Ball is attached to direct. Yeah. That's and, interesting. And like, if there's any sense of timing. Because if they're, if they intend to like make another Planet of the Apes movie in the next three years. If Zelda's happening in the next three years, then Westfall won't be able to be involved with it. Right. Other than, like, maybe an executive producer or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, wouldn't be able to be... In, well, he, he's, he's not going to be the director. He'd have to pick one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think that, like... Yeah, I mean, but would you walk away from directing a Zelda movie? Well, but what I'm saying is, uh, it will, I think it'll give us a sense of timing yeah, of the Zelda movie. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, I can make a whole other Planet of the Apes. Before this movie's before Zelda's gonna be ready to roll. Yeah, great point. We're not seeing Zelda until like twenty twenty nine, right? You know, twenty twenty eight. So yeah, just something to watch for. Read the tea leaves. Yeah, I like that. Although I mean, there's nothing really that says that they have to continue with the same director, right? Like uh, Matt Reeves didn't actually do all three of the movies in the previous trilogy; just the second two. Yeah, no, that that's absolutely true. And I'm not saying that they couldn't. They. Yeah, all I'm saying is if they yeah. announce a sequel to Pl- Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, it'll just be interesting to see if Wes Ball is attached as the director on right, it. Right, right, right. Um, and, yeah, when they... Because maybe Zelda is closer to, to go than we realize, and so he films that first, and then he does a Planet of the Apes sequel. Maybe a Planet of the Apes sequel is announced, and he's not attached to it, right. which means Zelda's, like, cooking. You know what I mean? Right. Well, and, like, the, uh, the other, like, apes directors are like and like people who are involved in the ape series that are directors are now like occupied with other stuff like Andy Serkis is going to be directing the new uh Lord of the Rings movie um and Matt Reeves is still doing Batman 2 right the Presumably, Batman 2 yeah um so like yeah I was trying to remember the name of the director of the first of the Rise of the Planet of the Apes yeah it's the impossible one <laughs> I 
I think it's like Rupert Evans. Because okay. I think he also directed Snow White and the Huntsman. Yeah, okay, yes. But I don't know what he's done since then. Uh, well, maybe they just get him back. Mark, a lot of movie talk in this episode. <laughs> um, okay. And finally, results from this weekend's Splatoon 3 Splatfest. The question, if you'll recall, is what do you want, what do you do at the world's end? Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer was... The winning answer. Oh, sorry, sorry. There there were three answers. There were three answers. They were Team Same Ol. Mm -hmm. You don't really do anything different. Right. Um, Team Bucket List. You're trying to check the things off your bucket list. Or Team Save the Day. Yeah. Which I think we determined we would be team save the day, right? I feel like you volunteered us for that, yeah. <laughs> I said team same old. I was like, well. That's not how we're going out. Okay. <laughs> the winner was team bucket list with uh, 415 points. Just uh, not that much higher than team same old. Right. Which was 395 points. Team save the day. Got trounced, trounced in this one. by uh, 60 points. Well, Trout oh, with, with, with 60 only 60 points. points. They yeah. had a, uh, yeah, it's uh, just an absolutely embarrassing showing from Saves the Day. Saves the Day team, you're not saving anything. Well, maybe they were too busy preparing for the apocalypse. That's a great point, yes. To, um, to partake in the Splatoon 3. Maybe, uh, maybe people were confused and they thought that it, picking that team meant that they would just listen to Saves the Day records. I bet that's it. That like late nineties, early two thousands, like emo band. Yep, that's probably what they were. That's thinking. probably what it was. I wouldn't want to do that. No. And you volunteered us for that. I, I maybe I must have confused them with real big fish. How dare you? <laughs> All right, Mark. Let's get out of the news. All right, that is going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Uh, thank you so much for listening. You should join our Discord if you're not in there already. Email us, Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. We will send you an invitation. Anthony DeLuca made our logo. Our theme music is provided by 8BitBetty. You can get more of his music by going to 8BitBetty.com or by listening right now. From my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Eller saying thank you for listening.